Hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee Palsgrove, and I'm one of the speech pathologists who works on the velopharyngeal dysfunction and craniofacial teams at Seattle Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk with you today about treatment of cleft-related speech disorders. So one of the things that I think is the most frustrating for me in my job is that when I refer a child to receive speech therapy and the therapist finds that they have a history of a cleft, their first instinct is to say, what can I do? This child just needs surgery. When in reality, it is not always a surgical solution. And so I'm going to talk with you today about velopharyngeal dysfunction and what that can entail and um, the power of speech therapy that can really make an impact in these kids' lives. Before we get started in talking about dysfunction, I want to give a little bit of a refresher about normal velopharyngeal function because I think having an understanding of that will make the rest of this make sense. Um, so normal velopharyngeal function involves complete velopharyngeal closure for all of the pressure consonants in the English language, and I've got those listed here. Um, we get variable velopharyngeal closure for our low pressure and vowel sounds, and then we expect that velopharyngeal port to be completely open for nasal consonants. And the pattern of closure is also important. And so when we start to say an utterance, we would expect the palate to elevate, close against the back of the throat, and remain closed throughout an entire utterance until we produce one of those nasal consonants or we take a breath. And what this slide is highlighting is how many sounds in our English system require that complete velopharyngeal closure. And so all of the sounds here in red, we refer to those as our pressure consonants. So those are the ones that we need the palate to close against the back of the throat for in order to produce that pressure buildup. And the sounds in blue are our nasal consonants. Um, and I highlight these because in our children who have a cleft palate, they are not able to produce any of these sounds in red until their palate is repaired, which kind of sets the stage for um, risk for speech and language delays. So when we're not able to get closure for um, those pressure consonants, we call that velopharyngeal dysfunction. And velopharyngeal dysfunction is an umbrella term that can mean so many different things. And really, I would like to give another one hour talk on just this slide alone because it's so packed full of information. Um, but I will give you the, the brief rundown. Um, so velopharyngeal dysfunction refers to any reason why the palate is not closing against the back of the throat for speech. And what we are all probably most familiar with is velopharyngeal insufficiency. And what that refers to is a structural deficit. The palate has been repaired, but there's still, sort, there's still some sort of structural deficiency that prevents the palate from reaching all the way to the back of the throat. And because that is a structural deficit, that is, we do need a surgical solution for this. So for those kids, surgery is the solution, and speech therapy really does not have much of a place. Velopharyngeal incompetence, on the other hand, is a much more complicated disorder, and it involves it involves a neurogenic reason why the palate is not reaching the back of the throat. And so with these kids, it's usually there's been some sort of event like a traumatic brain injury that causes a dysarthria, or maybe it's because the child has an underlying motor speech disorder like apraxia that prevents that palate from closing against the back of the throat. Um, these, these kids are really hard to manage, and so most often we recommend speech therapy using a motor-based approach, but there is a role for surgery or prosthetics for these kids as well. But where I'm going to spend my time today is on this, um, this part of this flow, flow sheet, um, and we're going to talk a lot about velopharyngeal mislearning, because velopharyngeal mislearning falls entirely within the speech pathologist's wheelhouse to um, diagnose and to treat. And so what is velopharyngeal mislearning? Um, it really, you can take, take those words apart and understand what it is, but it is a speech error that involves using the palate in an atypical way. So when children are using these speech errors, they're not, um, the palate isn't even attempting to close in that typical way. And what's really challenging is that, going back to this slide, any and all of these things can occur at the same time. And so before you start therapy with, with a child who has any of these things, you really need to know which, which if any of these you're dealing with. Um, but this is a speech disorder. It's not, um, does not fall within the developmental timeline. And so when these errors are present, we would consider them atypical at any age or stage of development, and we recommend speech therapy as soon as we can identify them. And so there are times that I've evaluated 18-month-olds who I've, um, I've, I hear that they have velopharyngeal mislearning and will recommend articulation therapy right away. Um, 
these do not improve with surgery. So even if the child has a VPI and they have some of these things going on, the VPI surgery is not going to eliminate this, the motor patterns, and so we still have to treat these with therapy. Um, these are not just an articulation disorder, which is another thing that I encounter a lot in my practice is it's like, ah, it's not a big deal. This is just an articulation disorder. Um, but these are really complicated errors that are hard to, hard to teach and tend to be really deeply ingrained. And so I like to shift my way of thinking about them as not just treating an articulation disorder, but you're also treating an airflow control disorder. And what I mean by that is that kids who weren't able to separate the nose from the mouth in those early, you know, first 12 months until their palate repair, even after that palate is repaired, there's still some confusion about how to direct and how to valve our air for speech. And so for, um, and for fluent intelligible, intelligible speech, we want coordinated function of all of the different subsystems, starting with our lungs. And so our lungs direct our air up through our vocal tract um, to, to really power our speech. And the first set of valves, um, the first set of, of valving for, for speech is at the vocal folds. And so the vocal folds either close, come together and vibrate to create our voicing, or they remain open for our voiceless consonants. And from there, the air should continue into the mouth. So the palate's function in this is to valve the air and direct it either into the mouth to create those pressure consonants, or to remain open so that we can create that nasal resonance for our nasal consonants. And from there, our air should be released out of our mouth. And for children who have these cleft-related speech disorders, they're not using this valve correctly, which throws off the other valves, um, impacts our articulation, and can impact our resonance and airflow control. Um, I want to take a moment just to talk about what you can do in speech therapy, even when VPI is present. And then the rest of this talk is going to really focus on specific speech therapy strategies. So if VPI is also present, there's still so much that speech therapy can do. Um, but what speech therapy cannot do is get rid of VPI. So if there is a structural deficit there, you will still hear nasal air emission and you will still hear hypernasality. And your speech therapy is not going to eliminate that. Speech therapy can also not strengthen the palate, nor should it even try to, because um, weakness of the palate is not, a, is not the etiology behind um, VPI. But what therapy can do is improve the child's intelligibility. So these are atypical speech errors that if they are taken away, then all we're hearing is VPI. You will be able to understand m much of that child's speech way more than if they had the errors and VPI. Um, the, what speech therapy can do and what I really rely on um, on my partners who are doing speech therapy out in the community or in schools is speech therapy can help with an accurate diagnosis. So as a team speech pathologist, I'm doing an evaluation and I might suspect that there's VPI present even at a really young age, but the child's speech might be so disordered that we don't really feel so confident about that diagnosis until they make a certain amount of progress in therapy. And so by undergoing speech therapy and establishing a repertoire of correctly articulated pressure consonants, this really helps the team have a better understand of the velopharyngeal mechanism so that we can make appropriate recommendations um, if there is a structural deficit present. Um, the other thing speech therapy can do is use nasal occlusion as a tool. So I know a lot of um, therapists who, if they're not super um, exposed to a lot of kids with VPI, it's really hard to tell the difference between what is VPI and what is the speech disorder. And so I'm often telling therapists, have the child plug their nose, have plug their nose and then do your articulation testing. If the speech sounds great with the nose plugged, then that's not a sound that you need to target. But if with the nose plugged, the speech um, sounds like an error, that's something you need to target. And so it helps you to kind of eliminate the impact that VPI has on what you're hearing so that you can really focus on that articulatory placement and help the kid um, direct their air into their nose. And so overall, the goals of this kind of ther therapy are to help the child to establish correct oral placement for all of their speech sounds, whether they're pressure consonants, nasal consonants, um, or whatever. You want to teach them new motor patterns to get rid of, um, to replace those old motor patterns. And you want to help them maximize their intraoral pressure buildup and direction of airflow. And I have this little caveat here where I say specific to the child's mechanism. And I have that there because 
if the child has VPI, then you're not gonna teach them normal pressure buildup and normal airflow control because if there's a structural deficit, we can't get rid of that. So you just wanna know what is normal for them or what is their mechanism capable of and kind of hone your ear into um, what that child's best, best productions can be. So in general, I know I keep saying that these are atypical speech sound substitutions, and they are, um, but they do follow some general guidelines or some, some general concepts. Um, we often say that, they that kids sacrifice place for manner. And what I mean by that is that fricatives tend to remain fricatives and stops tend to remain stops. They just move somewhere else in the oral cavity or out, even out of the oral cavity. And where they usually shift is back. And so sounds that are produced in the front of the mouth, like P and B, might get pushed all the way to the back of the throat um, to be a K and a G, for example, or might even be pushed all the way into the glottis and become a glottal stop. The most common velopharyngeal mislearning related errors are glottal stops and glottal fricatives, pharyngeal stops, pharyngeal fricatives, pharyngeal affricates, which I don't have there, um, posterior and anterior nasal fricatives, and overt nasal substitutions. And I don't know about, um, about everyone's training as far as graduate school goes, but these, these kinds of errors were not really taught in our phonology class. So this is not something that a lot of therapists have experience with. Um, and I think it's because it is such a, such a unique niche population. And so I wanna go into each of these error types in detail and talk about some specific therapy approaches that um, may or may not work depending on your kid. So let's say you have a child on your caseload who has these errors um, and you, we want to know where to begin. So I would say the first step in your plan of care should be to get in contact with a team speech pathologist. So they will know what surgeries the child has, has had. They will know what surgeries the child is going to have in the future. Um, and they will have a good idea about the integrity of the child's mechanism or they will be really excited to connect with you about trying to figure out the integrity of the child's mechanism together. Um, and they might have some good ideas about what and um, what goals would be the most beneficial to work on. From there, um, some general concepts are that many times I recommend starting with airflow awareness. And this is a unique area to this population, I think. And I'm going to go and devote some time just to that in just a bit. And from there, I tend to pick my goals based on how visible they are. So, and that usually means I'm, I'm working with the most interior sounds. And so if the child has a ton of sounds and errors, then I, in error, then I will usually pick P and B as my early targets because they are produced in the front of the mouth. They are super, um, they're super visible. And so you're able to give so many um, multimodal cueing for the child. Um, and I have a lot of tips and tricks for eliciting those, those early plosives. From there, I say go with whatever the child is stimulable for. Um, because the child is already demonstrating an atypical speech disorder with, with sounds that are not in our developmental timeline, you can throw that developmental timeline out the window. Um, my personal preference is after I target P and B, really the next sound that I go to for kids of all ages is TH um, because it meets those other criteria. It's super visible. It's really far interior. Um, it's far away from their error place of articulation. And um, I find that it's novel enough that kids are able to, to have some success with it early on. This kind of therapy is, um, is not novel. So it you're thinking about it in a little bit of a different way, but the principles of completing this kind of therapy are using general articulation principles and um, following principles of motor learning. And so um, I think of it as old motor plans and we're building new motor plans. And so anything we can do to kind of sneak around that child's old motor plan to establish a new um, accurate plan is, is my goal in each therapy session. I always start by giving our sounds a new name to promote that new motor plan, and I get families to buy into this with me early on too. And so we will say, we're not working on the S. The S is old sound, that's our old way. We're working on a new sound. I always call it the snake sound, but you can call it whatever the child thinks is fun or silly, um, 
and gets gets their attention and you're able to have success with. Um, I don't use anything fancy. I use visuals frequently, but I just pull up BoardMaker and we'll have picture cues for each of our new sounds and we'll have the, we'll label the sounds together. Like our P is our popping sound and F is our feather sound or whatever you want to do. And then most of my kids get sent home with these just so that the family knows the kind of cueing that we're using. That's another big part of this type of therapy is just to make your um, your therapy sessions really explicit. So I want the families to know what we're working on and I want the kids to know what we're working on. And so I often start our sessions um, saying things like, all right, we're gonna work on our quiet sound. What was our quiet sound? And then have them um, just produce it for me. And we say, yeah, now we're ready and, and, and move forward with our session. The principles of motor learning, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but I do want to give a quick refresher just because I know this is not, um, we're not all doing this kind of therapy all the time. But in general, I tend to start with mass practice and then fade to varied practice as the child gets more confident, and that helps build in that gener generalization. Um, same thing with our context variation. So I'll start working with just one sound in just one position um, in mass practice and do that until the child is quite accurate with it. And then we'll start varying it, putting it in different words, putting it in different um, word positions, saying it in silly voices, loud, quiet, or whatever to just help build in that automaticity. Um, as far as the schedule goes, I usually start with the block schedule, transitioning to random schedule as the child gets more confident. And we'll start out with that performance-based feedback. So at first, I'm just trying to get the kid excited about participating. And I'll say, good job, good trying, and leave, um, leave my feedback pretty vague. But as they start to have more success, then I start letting them know what they're doing. Like, ah, you got your lips together. I really liked how you popped your air. Um, or like, uh-oh, I heard that one sneak down into your throat or sneak into your nose. Let's try it again with our mouth and our air. So you're giving them the terminology, that feedback to um, that's really specific so that they're able to start correcting those errors more independently. Um, I start with frequent, immediate, um, rapid feedback after really every, um, every production. And then you want to be fading that away into more variable, more inconsistent feedback so that the child, that gives the child the opportunity to kind of self-monitor and start um, even self-correcting before you're able to jump in and tell them what they did. And then always, um, you might have to start out using a really slow way, slow rate, having them like elongate their snake sound and slowly blend it into words. But you're always wanting to work to that normal, traditional, um, what we think of as standard rate of speech. And so what this therapy looks like is drill. So it's a lot of drill. It's a lot of repetition. Um, but there's so many ways of making it fun. Um, in fact, I think drill-based therapy, I have the most fun with drill-based therapy. That's just my personal preference. Most importantly though, motor learning is task specific. That means that to achieve better speech, you have to practice speaking. And so non-speech activities such as sucking and blowing and whistles and flutes and um, vibrating, stretching, any of those activities, they do not directly carry over to speech. And so we should not have these as part of our, part of our therapy plan. Um, there's a lot of literature out there to support this and I won't go into it, but I could not, do this talk without mentioning that. I do feel like the cleft population is specifically vulnerable to these, these kinds of therapy plans of, um, of teaching them to blow just because there is so much air coming out of the mouth for that. And I do some blowing in my therapy, which I will talk about in just a minute as airflow control. But the point is that non-speech oral motor exercises do not strengthen the palate or have any impact on our speech. And um, beyond that, beyond using the principles of motor learning, this really just, um, once you establish a sound in isolation, you just continue up the traditional speech hierarchy like we've all, all learned at some point in our careers. The few, um, the, the differences that I think are unique to this population is that sometimes before I can elicit a sound in isolation, I might have to back up a level into, into teaching that airflow control, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, I do find that my biggest struggle most of the time is getting that sound successfully in isolation. Once we're able to get that sound successfully in isolation, then we're set and we're able to just build that up um, to different contexts. But some of these kids are so, so tricky to just elicit that first sound correctly, which is where that airflow control piece comes in so importantly. 
The other thing that I think is unique, um, a unique consideration, is that instead of drilling to 80% accuracy or writing my goals for 80% accuracy, I often write them for 100% accuracy, especially in these um, what I call the foundation skills of isolation and syllables. And I find that if we do try to move up the hierarchy too quickly before the child is um, close to 100% accuracy, then you just end up backsliding. And so I do try to drill these until they're really automatic. Um, I have a blurb in here about nasal occlusion. I know I mentioned it earlier. So um, if you are using nasal occlusion as a therapy tool, then I do try to fade it at about the syllable level, just because you can build reliance on it if you're using too much nasal occlusion. And so um, I try to fade it before single words, but if I find that when I'm transitioning to single words, they slip back into their old patterns, then I know that I'm not ready to fade nasal occlusion yet. All right, so my note on airflow control, and um, because a lot of the time when I'm talking with therapists, they're like, that sounds kind of like blowing. Aren't we supposed to not be blowing for, for speech? And I say, I, I know, I promise it's not a non-speech oral motor exercise. Um, and the reason it's not a non-speech oral motor exercise is the end point is different. The goal is different. I am not trying to strengthen the palate or directly, um, directly affect my speech goals by teaching this. What I'm doing is I'm trying to establish joint vocabulary um, and teaching young kids a, a super abstract concept. And so um, what I'm doing is I'm having them blow on a pinwheel so that they can see what I mean about mouth coming in, um, air coming out of their mouth. We're saying our sounds with a tissue in front of our mouth so that they can see the power of the air as it comes out of their mouth when they say their pressure sounds. And so this really is just visualizing um, and teaching that concept of airflow control, and it, and it is not um, directly going to target speech. As soon as a child seems to like get this concept um, and they're able to volitionally get air out of their mouth uh, on command, I will shape that into speech sounds or, or move right to my speech goals. All right. Um, so for the rest of this, I just want to talk about each of those specific and villopharyngeal miscerning error types and talk about some elicitation techniques that tend to work if the child is presenting with those errors. And each one of these um, groups of errors I want to think about in the context of airflow control, place of articulation, and resonance because it, we're not just dealing with place of articulation because if the place of the articulation is in the throat and the airflow control is not in the mouth, then our resonance is thrown off. Um, and so I want to really reinforce how all of these influence each other. We'll start with glottal, the glottal place for articulation, which includes glottal stops, um, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, and glottal fricatives, which is just a fancy way to say H, um, because these are pretty common, um, pretty common in, the, in children who have a repaired cleft palate. So the place of articulation for these is here at the glottis. Um, and what, what's happening with air, our airflow control is that instead of moving past the vocal folds into the mouth or um, for speech, it's getting squeezed and stopped right here. And so what that does is it reduces all of our oral resonance because our voicing is not able to carry up into the mouth to have that reverberating quality. Um, in general, glottal stops tend to be substituted for oral stops, and glottal fricatives tend to be substituted for oral fricatives, but I've seen kids substitute these for just every speech sound in between. Um, and one of the other unique things about these is that they can also be co-articulated. And what I mean by that is that the child might be stopping their, the air here at the vocal folds and also doing the right thing with their lips. So for a P, um, I see this often for voiceless plosives specifically. Um, so instead of saying puppy, they might be saying puppy. So you get this, um, their lips coming together, but they're also stopping the air here. And that's why we can't just focus on place of articulation. We also have to work on getting that air and getting that energy um, past the vocal folds into the mouth. I've got a couple of examples of what this sounds like. And um, this child is using glottal fricatives. I hang a high. So they're saying, I see the sky. I'll play that one one more time. I hang a high. And then this next child is using glottal stops. So they're saying, pull the baby buggy. But you could hear that for every single one of their plosives, they are using a glottal stop substitution. And these really impact the child's intelligibility.
Um, for glottal stops, I, I usually start with, um, especially if it's pervasive, I'll start from the ground up and we will pull out diagrams. I hope you guys will like this diagram because I use it about 10 more times in this talk. Um, I pull out diagrams to help the child establish some baseline skills. So we talk about airflow control, about where our air is supposed to come out for speech. Um, and then I work on their ability to discriminate their throat sound or their aired sound from whatever target sound I'm working on. And so I might have them point at a diagram and I'll say, uh -uh, and they'll point if I made that in my mouth or if I made that in my throat. And then we might move on to seeing if they can identify it in, identify it in their own speech. Um, and that's just a way to bring awareness to what sound we are targeting so that um, it puts child kind of puts the child in control of their own their own session. From there, uh, one of my go-to techniques is using whispered speech. So if you think about what we're doing when, our, when we're whispering is that we're not really bringing our vocal folds together to create that voicing. I find this particularly helpful for kids who are um, co-articulating the glottal stops. So they're already doing the right thing with their mouth, but they're using that glottal stop. And so I'll say, you know what, let's instead of making it noisy, and then we'll feel for our motors and talk about noisy speech, ah, uh, oh, We'll talk about, let's keep our motor off and say it again. Pop, pop, pop. And that way you're just building that motor plan, that new motor plan that doesn't have that, that glottal stop co-articulated with it. For kids who have um, very few sounds to work with um, and they have a lot of glottal stops as their errors, then I will use whatever sounds they have to try to shape it into one of the oral stops. And so one of my other favorite, these are all my favorite techniques, I'm going to say for all of them. Um, one of my favorite techniques is shaping with nasal occlusion. So if we think about place, manner, and voicing, and when we use what we know as speech pathologists, we can get quite creative with shaping old sounds into new sounds. And so to shape a B from an M, I will often have the child, if they have an M, um, I'll often have them hold that sound out. So, mm, b and then as soon as you plug the nose, it, it immediately makes that into a pressure consonant. And then we'll say, oh, wow, did you feel that pop on your lips? Did you hear the way that that lip was, or that sound was kind of poppy? Um, and it was different from that long sound, like, mm. And we'll do that a few times, mm, bah, mm, bah, until the child seems to get it. And I'll say, hey, can you do that without me plugging your nose? Mm, bah, and see if they're able to do it themselves. You can use that same concept to shape a D from an N and a G from an NG or an ing. And visualizing the airflow, I often do in conjunction with some of these other techniques. Um, and this is just adding an extra layer of cueing, making it more multimodal, um, more sensory for the child, and it really helps it make it helps it click. Um, and so one of my favorite, which my son here is modeling, is using a tissue held in front of the mouth to help the child see the sound come out of their mouth. And so in this first picture here, he's saying, uh, he's using a glottal stop instead of up, which was our target. And he is not putting the air in his mouth. And so the tissue doesn't do anything. It just kind of hangs there, which is not very fun. But it, when I model and say, ah, let's look what, we, look what happens when we put our air in our mouth, up, uh, the tissue moves very reinforcing, especially for younger kids. Um, it's novel enough that, um, that it tends to work a lot of the time. And you can then just kind of drill that motor pattern into place. You can do the same thing with um, feathers, cotton balls, really anything lightweight that will move when you, whenever you have that plosion on it. And um, that can be really reinforcing for children. For kids, these are my least favorite techniques. Um, for kids who have really disordered speech and you're struggling, they maybe don't even have M's or nasal consonants to shape things from. If I'm just trying to establish any oral sound, then I will sometimes shape a, a, a plosive from a non-speech task. And so this might be where I go straight from that airflow control teaching um, and try to shape those non-speech non things into speech. And so some of what we might do is puff our cheeks over and over again. So we'll catch our air and then we'll let it go. And if we do that quickly enough, then you're able to, to get a P approximation and then try to start working that into, um, into a, a closer P production, moving up into syllables and so on.
for kids who are using glottal stops and they're really showing a preference for using their glottis, I will use that to my advantage and I'll have them produce that H, especially if they're able to do it on command, um, because that will that will keep them from doing a glottal stop if they're using an H because they're keeping those vocal folds open. And we work on getting that continuous airstream into the mouth. Once they're able to do that with different vowel sounds, then we'll do super silly stuff like catching that air with our lips. And so we might say, ha, and pretty soon you've almost said hop. So you went from never having a P to having a consonant vowel consonant production um, with a final production. And that is a trick that, that works for some kids, especially if they have that really deeply ingrained field of frontal mislearning. So moving on to pharyngeal stops, pharyngeal fricatives, and pharyngeal affricates. Um, this is another group of pharyngeal mislearning related errors. And the place of articulation for these is taking the base of our tongue and pulling it to the posterior pharyngeal wall. And if you guys are sitting there at home even trying to produce this, they're pretty complicated. Um, that, that action of pulling that tongue so far back is a really atypical motor plan. What our airflow control is doing is it is being stopped or squeezed at the pharynx, in the pharynx, and that really can have an impact on our resonance. So if our tongue is all the way back into our pharynx for most of our utterances, then the sound energy is not able to reverberate in the mouth and the nose like it's supposed to. So you can have resonance that sounds kind of trapped in the pharynx or, or cul-de-sac in nature. In general, pharyngeal stops are most often substituted for velar stops, so K's and G's will shift a little further back to, um, to pharyngeal stops. And then pharyngeal fricatives can be substituted for any fricative. Most often we see like S, Z, and SH. And then pharyngeal affricates are substitute, substituted for oral affricates. And I'll let you guys hear what these sound like. This first example is of some pharyngeal stops. So you can tell that it kind of sounds like a K and a G. It's just a lot more throaty. And um, this next sample is a child saying Jim and Charlie chew gum, except for he's using pharyngeal fricatives and pharyngeal affricates. Jim and Charlie chew gum. And what I want to point out there is not only can you hear the articulation substitutions, but you can hear how the whole resonance is just um, just doesn't sound typical. We'll play that one more time. Then it's how it shoots them. Awesome. Um, these are tricky to tricky to target in therapy. I usually start with those same establishing and um, same principles to establish the baseline skills. We'll pull out diagrams, talk about our airflow control, and get the child familiar with differentiating between their coughing sound and whatever target sound we're wanting to treat. Um, if I am if the child has a lot of pharyngeal fricatives and pharyngeal stops, I will target the pharyngeal fricatives first because I try to save K and G for last of anything that I do. Um, and so I'll start with the fricatives and I most often use shaping. And so if I think about what, what the air production is, is the tongue pulled all the way into the back of the throat. The goal of my therapy is to get it as far away from that place of articulation as possible. And so I will have the child move their tongue as far out as possible and produce a fricative. Um, we will start with the TH and we'll call that our new sound. Um, even if they already have TH, then I'll teach it even further exaggerated. Um, and we'll say, oh, it's our new sound. This is our snake sound or our quiet sound or whatever. Um, and once they have the, the concept of the tongue being anterior and the airflow being directed over the tongue, we'll slowly start to pull the tongue back to shape it into an S and then pull it back a little bit more to shape it into an SH. And that really is my tried and true um, I, the trick for, for these. For K and G, um, these are really tricky because it can, if you're not used to hearing pharyngeal stops very often, then they can be, you, you might, it's easy to reinforce a pharyngeal stop thinking it's a velar stop because they sound so similar. And so I'll often start with ing, probing ing, and if they have what I think is a true velar ing, then I'll use nasal occlusion to elicit a G, and then we'll turn our motor off and make it into a K and go from there. Um, other things are just any other traditional um, articulation principle to try to get a, a velar and we'll start with like a velar fricative or your angry cat sound or whatever you want to call it where you hold out that and then catch it um, and stop it so that it, it can become that velar stop. <laughs> 
All right, moving on to nasal fricatives, which are the next, next class of velofrontal mislearning related errors I wanna talk about. Um, these are my favorite to identify. They're my favorite to treat. Um, they are so rewarding to eliminate from a child's repertoire because it is, they're, they're so atypical that it has just the most magical impact on intelligibility when they're no longer using these. Um, the place of articulation for nasal fricatives is at the velopharyngeal port. So the child is either constricting their air here or they're pushing it all the way to the front of their nose where there's, there's no level of oral or even pharyngeal constriction here. Um, most often we see nasal fricatives substituted for our oral fricatives, or SRZ or SH, um, but they can be used for any fricative, any affricate, um, and I've seen them used for all of those. These, just like the glottal stops, can be co-articulated. So the child might be doing the right thing with their tongue. They might have their tongue to the alveolus to make their S sound, but instead of putting it in the mouth, they push it through the nose. Um, what these have, the impact these have on our resonants is that many kids, if they're using these and they're pervasive in the speech sample, it will increase the perception of hypernasality because that palate is being held open. The velofringal port is being held open when it's supposed to be closed. So that sound energy is influenced by, by that extra opening. Um, these are the most frequently confused with VPI because you're hearing air come out of the nose and they can occur with VPI. And so it's really important to, to know what the child's mechanism is and to know if you're dealing with a nasal fricative or velopharyngeal insufficiency. And a quick check is really to just take a good sample, um, a good speech sample to, to know what the child's um, strengths are. And if you're hearing normal plosives and normal production of other fricatives, but you hear a ton of air coming out of the nose on one specific speech sound or one class of speech sounds, that is a, a major red flag that you're dealing with a speech disorder and not a structural deficit, as a structural deficit would impact all of those sounds equally. I wanna show you a video um, of what these look like. Ah, oh, maybe. Baby buggy. Okay. I'm going to pause it there just to orient you. I know this is kind of fuzzy, but this is a lateral view of the speech mechanism. This darker shadowy spot is the upper jaw. The lower shadowy spot is the um, lower jaw. And then there's a shadowy place about here that you're going to see move up and down. And that's the palate. And what I want you to focus on is how well that palate moves for certain sounds and then how much it does not move for other sounds. Hold the baby buggy. Give cake the cake. Give cake the cake. Sissy sees the sky. Sissy sees the sky. Jim and Charlie chew gum. Jim and Charlie chew gum. And count one to twenty. So you can see that the palate was able to get complete closure against the posterior pharynx for um, for all the speech sounds except for it opened wide for just the S's. Um, that is why this is called phoneme-specific nasal air emission or phoneme-specific VPI um, because it really does tend to target sounds or classes of sounds in isolation. My, um, these of all the different errors, I think are the most important to spend a good amount of time in therapy establishing those baseline skills, especially teaching the child the concept of their airflow. And so we are all the time talking about, oh, that was your nose air. We want to use our mouth air and really make sure the kid knows what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm using those terms. And we'll even have practice where we are using our mouth air. So let's say some sounds that we know we're using our mouth air for. Pa, pa, pa. And then we'll say, all right, let's, let's use our nose air and have them volitionally put that air into their nose so that they know that they have that control over it. Um, I also use diagrams for these um, where I'll have the child point to the nose if they hear air coming out of my nose or point to their mouth if, if they hear my air coming out of their mouth. Um, a lot of people like to use biofeedback for these speech errors, especially if they're occurring in isolation. Um, what you see pictured here is something called a seascape. And the way this works is we've got this tip of the appliance that you hold to the child's nose, and then it's attached to a tube, which is attached to another tube, which has this little um, lightweight styrofoam piece on it. And so if the child uses a nasal fricative, the styrofoam piece goes flying, and you're able to say like, uh-oh, that one came out of your nose. Um, 
as you can imagine, anyone who works with kids, that can be super reinforcing to see the thing flying up and down. So you have to be really careful from the get-go to say, we want to keep this, you know, keep it in its home. Sometimes I'll draw like a little line on the tube to say like, all right, every time we keep it under the line, we earn a point or we do whatever token reinforcement you um, like to use. And I find that biofeedback works better with older kids. The oral nasal listener is another biofeedback device, except for instead of that auditory biofeedback, they're listening. Um, and it's got almost what looks like a two-headed stethoscope where they hold one end to their nose and the other end to their ear, and you have an ear set too, and then you train the child to listen for their nasal fricatives um, as they're talking into the mouthpiece. You can do the same concept with a straw. Um, my favorite technique, though, is another favorite technique, is nasal occlusion. So what nasal occlusion does is it completely blocks the child's ability to, do, to use a nasal fricative. Um, so if you have any question if the child is using a nasal fricative, plug their nose, and if they go and they kind of do a Valsalva and they're saying their ear hurts, that is a surefire sign that they were using a nasal fricative um, because they were actively pushing that air into their nose. And I'm going to show you a quick video of poor nasal occlusion form. This is my daughter who clearly knows this is my favorite therapy technique and did this as she was sitting in my lap. <laughs> And so that is not good nasal occlusion form. What I recommend is using something like this. Um, you can call it your chicken wings or your dragon wings. And if you have the child occlude their nose by holding each finger on the side, you have a better view of their mouth. So um, you can really help with that articulation feedback too. If you are using nasal fricatives as a therapy tool, you do want to fade as soon as the child seems like they're able to automatically get that air into their mouth. And the way that I tend to fade is I'll either start um, sliding my no my fingers up my nose or um, so that they're still kind of getting that that tactile cue but it's not actually blocking the path of airflow or other times I might um you know take one hand away and then take both hands away um, just whatever seems to work for the child um, Finally, I think that, no, this is not finally. I have another slide after this. I also like to use um, shaping as a therapy technique. And so old tried and true long T method works really well for children who are using nasal fricatives for an S, but they have a strong T. And so what we'll do is just say like, all right, let's say that T sound. All right, let's say it a little bit smaller. Let's hold it out. And then you just reinforce like, wow, that sounded like the snake sound we were going for. And then just um, keep reinforcing it that way. I've got a little case um, study to have you guys listen for here just to let you know how powerful these nasal fricatives can be um, and how treating them can be so powerful. This sample is a child who came into craniofacial clinic one day who was new to the team, had had many, many surgeries, and um, I was the last provider of the team to see her that day. And I had three different people come up to me and say, oh, what are we gonna do about this kid's VPI? Like, we've, we're dealing with significant VPI, has already had multiple surgeries, um, really, you know, we're not sure what, what to do next. And so I went in, and this is the speech sample that I heard. E uh, mm, ma, 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 pa, 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 ka, 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 ka. I love mom eat cake, ice in the sky, ice cream gum, fly funny fish, throw me a shoe. And so if by listening to that, there should be a few red flags that are kind of going off in your head. The first one was that I'm hearing really strong plosives. Um, I'm hearing strong plosives without a ton of air coming out of, out of the nose for those. But for all the fricatives, I hear a ton of air, unobstructed nasal air emission. That mismatch tells me that this can't possibly be a structural problem because the structure would impact all of those sounds. We must be dealing with some nasal fricatives. Um, at this point, I wasn't convinced that she had no VPI. I just thought it's not as severe as it sounds. And so I was able to pull out the long T method um, and take a listen. Daddy. And let's say a, that T sound, I want you to make it really small. T -t 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 -t. Nice work, and let's make it even smaller. And let's make it small and hold it out. Nice work, and let's say. And so what you're hearing is she's producing an oral S. 
there's a tiny bit of air coming out of her nose for those of you who can hear that, but that is, that is minimal. Um, that is not something that we would want to make a surgical decision on. And so um, this was, this was a teenager whose mom had never heard her saying us before. She had never heard her saying us, heard herself saying us before. And so the room was so excited. We were all so excited that right then and there, we were able to have um, some immediate success. And I knew that she would be an excellent candidate for therapy. Um, another, another cue that I do a lot of the time, really in conjunction with some of these others, is, is adding the visual and tactile cueing of, of the airflow. And so we're all the time talking about feeling the air coming out of our mouth when we're saying our fricatives, or we're catching our air with a straw, or we're pulling the air out of our mouth, um, whatever the kid, um, whatever really resonates with the kid, we're able to, um, to help them to visualize that air coming out of their mouth. And so this next sample is the same, the same person that I showed in the previous um, sample, but we are saying we're working on um, SH instead. And really all I did for her was I said, ah, say it, but feel it. Say it again, but feel the air come out of your mouth. That was literally the only cue that I added to her and, and hear how successful she is. Let's try old way. I want you to say shoo. Mm. And let's try to feel the mouth, the air come out of your mouth when you say shh. Nice. And say shoo. Shoo. Nice job. Do you feel the difference between that? Mm -hmm. Is that what you and so that clip is highlighting a couple of different things. First of all, that the therapy does not have to be hard. Sometimes just elevating your level of cueing, of level of cueing by just a little bit, you're able to elicit the sounds out of the mouth um, quite quickly. The other thing that you hear a little bit at the end there is that, especially for my older kids, I'm always having that moment of self reflection self-reflection and having them like, did you feel it? Could you hear the difference? Because I find that it builds in that self-monitoring so much faster. Regardless of whatever approach I'm using to treat nasal fricatives, um, I almost always stage my approach. And so I prioritize any sound coming out of the mouth over air coming out of the nose. It doesn't matter if it's dentalized. In fact, I'll teach a dentalized S a lot of the time. Um, if it's lateralized or just not super precise, I will take it. I will reinforce it um, so that we are just first getting rid of the habit of putting the air in the nose and then we will fine tune placement later. All right, so the last thing that I want to talk about are um, overt nasal substitutions. These aren't always considered classic velopharyngeal mislearning related errors, but I find that they happen so much that I wanted to, to talk about them. And so the place of articulation for these, really it's, it's wherever the nasal consonants are being produced. These are preferential use of nasal consonants over pressure consonants. Um, there's not really anything to comment on with airflow control because the child is not trying to, to build up any oral airflow at all. So they're really just leaving that palate open and letting the sound energy resonate in the nose and in the mouth. This, the impact this has on resonance is that these kids are always perceived to be hypernasal. So um, I'll get referrals from children for our VPI clinic and they'll come in and they do sound hypernasal and it's because the only sound they have is an M. That does not necessarily mean they have VPI, it means that they have a limited speech sound uh, repertoire and we need to work on that in therapy. What this is not is over nasal substitutions are not passive um, or obligatory nasalization of voice pressure consonants that we think of when we're thinking of VPI. So what I'm talking about is if a child says an M for a P. So if I say, all right, let's say pop, and they say mom, then that error crossed um, manner, it crossed voicing. That was a really atypical, not at all close production of P. And so I know that they weren't trying to say P and it just was nasalized because of the structural deficit, because they voiced it. There's a lot of stuff going on there. That's a red flag for, for an overt nasal substitution. Um, this gets a lot more complex if they're using these in place of voiced sounds. So if I have a child say baby and it comes out as mamie, then I really can't make a choice, a decision yet, because that might be VPI, or it might be that they were substituting an M for a B, and I need to do more, um, more differential diagnosis to figure out what's going on. These kids, especially if they have frequent um, nasal substitutions, 
I almost always recommend a period of diagnostic therapy before we make a call on their velofrontal function because um, it can be really hard to tell and really easily confused with VPI. So this is just uh, some brief examples of what these might sound like. Pop, 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 pop. Let's do that one with our air. Can you feel for it? Pop. Mop. And say puppy. Puppy. Baby. Me, me. And do bye, bye. My, my. And say boo. Boo. Very nicely. And, say and so there's a lot of stuff going on there. So at first, um, at first he produced mop and our target was pop. And so we tried again with a little bit of cueing. It still came out as mop. And so I thought, all right, this context is not working. Probed a different context and got puppy with two, um, two P's that sounded much closer to P's than in the previous utterance. Um, I still wanted to probe across other, other contexts. And so I started, started looking at the B's, which came out immediately as M's. And then I thought, oh gosh, are we dealing with VPI? What's going on? But then I probed ac across vowels, probed across other contexts, and you heard that really strong B at the end there. And so this tells me that this child is, is prefer preferentially using some of these nasal consonants as overt substitutions for other sounds, and we need a lot of speech therapy. Um, here's another quick example. And say shoo. Shoo. Make your air come in your mouth. Shh. Shh. There you go. And say shaw. No. Nah. And so here again, you could see that at first we started with words. That wasn't successful. Backed it up a little bit. Was able to get some airflow, some frication out of the mouth. It was not typical, but I didn't care. It was coming out of the mouth. Tried to work it back up to vowels. Immediately came out as na. Nah. So those are nasal substitutions. Um, wish I had a good trick for those. I don't. These are really hard. Um, these I find when children are using overt nasal substitutions pervasively, we're usually dealing with a bigger speech disorder than just velofrontal mislearning. Um, anecdotally, these are kids who have, you know, motor speech disorders or they're just, just very speech disorder. There's a lot going on. And so I tend to break my targets down by the distinctive features, really talking about place and manner and voicing so that we're able to differentiate um, differentiate the sounds. So for example, for targeting P, I might tell the child, all right, we're getting our lips together, we're turning our motor off, let's feel for our motor, and we're making the air pop out of our mouth. So making the cueing just really explicit and breaking down those distinctive features. I find that voicing is the one, and because all of the nasal consonants are voiced, working on really contrasting the nasal consonants with the voiceless plosives will usually be where I start, just because you can you can contrast those so beautifully just by turning the, the motor off and then get some new speech sounds in their inventory, which helps, um, helps intelligibility. And so in summary, um, these are, this is a population that is near and dear to my heart. I love my job. I love working with these kids doing diagnosis and um, making diagnoses and doing therapy. And if there's only a few take home points that I wanna give you, I wanna let you know to, if you have a child like this on your caseload, collaborate with the team speech pathologist. Um, they will be able to help the differential diagnosis. And if they can't, then they can partner with you because they will know the child's diagnosis and the team and that plan, but you're gonna know what the child is actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what kind of progress they're making. And so really collaborating together will make a huge difference um, in how successful the plan goes. This therapy is just traditional articula um, articulation therapy paired with principles of motor learning and adding that level of airflow control. So not just articulation, adding the level of airflow control um, will really help to speed your therapy plan along. Um, and then finally, be dynamic. So I threw out a ton of different techniques to try today, and I they don't all work for every child. And I have kids who I still struggle with. I'm like, ah, how do I get that fricative? None of these things have worked for this child. And so you really have to be dynamic and and don't be afraid to try new things and circle back to old ideas that, that didn't work previously. And just be really flexible with your therapy. I've got um, a few little resources here. So the American Cleft Palate Craniofacial Association is, is like the governing body for cleft uh, palate craniofacial teams. And so if you need to know who your team is, then you can go to the, the website listed here.
either of the websites. And then there's a lot of resources online that have a lot of the principles I talked about today and good videos. I know the ASHA practice portal is an excellent resource. If you're specifically interested in this population, then ASHA's SIG, um, special interest group five has a really robust listserv that I find to be super helpful. And then the ACPA website, again, has a lot of public publications. It's got speech samples to kind of hone your ear in on different resonance disorders, so you can listen to those. And then this textbook that I have here, The Clinician's Guide to Treating Cleft Palate Speech, is like the holy grail. I um, really love this book, refer to it all of the time, and think it has a lot of cl uh, clinician-friendly, um, it's written in a way that's just so clinician-friendly that I, that I use it so often. All right, and that is all I have. Thank you guys.